The Pittsburgh Pirates had a banner evening last night in Milwaukee, exercising some demons of sorts. We're going to talk about how the Pirates can build off of that big win and get a crucial series win tonight on today's episode of Locked on Pirates. You are Locked on Pirates, your daily Pittsburgh Pirates podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome back, everybody, to the Locked On Pirates Podcast here on the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team, your Pittsburgh Pirates every single day. My name is Ethan Smith, your host of this wonderful show here on the Locked On Podcast Network, bringing you your news, analysis, opinions, and reactions to everything going on in the world of the Pittsburgh Pirates from a lifelong fan Two lifelong fans just like you. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Make sure you go download the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. And if you were on Prize Picks last night and had anything to do with hits and RBIs and runs and everything of the sort, well, then you probably would have won a good bit of money last night as the Pittsburgh Pirates found a way to exercise some demons in their supposed house of horrors last night, defeating the Milwaukee Brewers 12-2 to on Tuesday night to now win two in a row. Big question, can they finally get that elusive third win in a row again, something that has pretty much left this team since the beginning of the year. But we're not going to discuss that until a little bit later when we discuss the biggest surprises so far uh, about Rowdy's turnarounds, Keynes and Jones' brilliance, the bullpen not being the strength we thought. We're also going to continue the mock trade series. And right now we're going to talk about how the Pirates can build off of this big victory they had last night that featured just a bunch of different really good moving parts. Everybody in the lineup except Jared Triolo and Michael A. Taylor had a hit on the evening last night. Joey Bart with his second grand slam of the year. Jack Sawinski had a home run. Rowdy Telez had a home run. Joshua Palacios had a home run. Brian Reynolds had a home run. It was a very big banner evening for this Pirates offense yesterday, getting 11 hits, 12 RBIs, only striking out seven times, which I found very interesting because they did struggle against Colin Ray a lot the last time that they played him, but they found a way to get after this Brewers team. And that was one of my big talking points on yesterday's show is that I wanted to see the Pirates attack early. They scored two runs in the third inning to take a 2 nothing lead, obviously lose the lead in the following half inning. But then the sixth inning came and the offense just exploded. And we saw that not even a week ago. Against this, uh, against the New York Mets when this team just had an explosion of offense. And a lot of that is coming from guys now that you wanted to get production out of earlier in the season that you just weren't getting production out of. You have Rowdy Telez, who had a two-for-four evening and has been one of the best hitters in all of Major League Baseball since June 1st and has had one of the bigger turnarounds that we've seen really ever from a Pittsburgh Pirates player, but we'll discuss that more later. Nick Gonzalez, who had that rough patch, is finally starting to get things rolling back for him as well. Jack Sawinski, who we really want to see play well for this team because this team desperately needs left-handed power, even found a way to have a two for five night last night. You know, the OPS just above 600, you still want that to be a lot better, but you're starting to get contributions from everybody again. And I think that that's a massive thing for this Pittsburgh Pirates team because Quinn Priester yesterday was just electric in his return from the injured list. Josh Fleming came into the game to start the game. He obviously was an opener. We've seen Josh Fleming do that a good bit already. He's looked better in some of those stints than he did last night. Had three walks, albeit in a scoreless first inning. And then Quinn Priester came into the game, folks. And after those two runs that came across in the third inning, he was just shut down. Six innings pitch, four hits, only one earned run because there was an error involved in there. Two walks and eight strikeouts for Priester, getting his first win on the season as well. He entered the game with an 0-5 record, so he gets his first victory of the season out of the rotation for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And even Dennis Santana, who came in relief for him, albeit the game was very well out of reach, Dennis Santana had a pretty good outing last night as well. Two innings pitched, no earned runs, one walk and four Ks. So the Pirates 
pitching did what you expected it to do and did what it has done over the course of the last couple of weeks. It only allowed six hits on the evening. It was a group that you know is going to go out there more often than not and give you a good performance. I just urge this offense, as I urged them yesterday, to find some consistency. Yes, it's nice that you put up 12 runs. Yes, it's nice that your guys are hitting home runs and you're getting a big victory, a victory unlike no other, mind you, in Milwaukee because the Pirates – dating back to even when the Milwaukee Braves were a team, have never beaten a Milwaukee baseball team in Milwaukee by double-digit runs. Last night, that was the first time that that had ever happened in Pirates history. So that was a massive part of this too. But now, how, to the, how do you build on it? How do you continue this train now? Because yes, you had a good game as well on Monday. Pirates scored eight runs on Monday against the New York Mets to win that game eight to two. So the pitching has been there. We know that the pitching is going to be there for this team moving forward. It's just a matter of this offense doing what they've done over the last two games consistently. Now, obviously, I'm not saying score eight to 12 runs every single game, but this team has an exponentially amazing record when they all they do is put up more than three runs. That's all you really need. Just put up four or five runs on a consistent basis, and you're going to start seeing the wins just add up and add up and add up. And then when you're pertaining it to this Milwaukee Brewer series and going into tonight's game, getting the series clinching victory tonight would be massive for a plethora of reasons. One, you would be guaranteeing the series win in Milwaukee, and yes, you are trying to still chase them down. It's still very unlikely that you do chase them, but you are in the middle of the wild card race, and with the win last night and some other things going on around the league, the Pirates are only three games out of the wild card. So you have the wild card implications that add to this. You have the idea that you could gain some ground on Milwaukee no matter what if you get the victory tonight, and you have Paul freaking Skeens pitching tomorrow for the first time against Milwaukee in a chance to sweep. So I would argue that tonight's game is almost more important than what they did last night because what a lot of you and me and everybody else that follows and covers this team wants to see is some consistency with this offense. It's, an, it's a unit that has the tools to be a good unit. You look at Reynolds, you look at Telez and what he's been able to do. Um, Nick Gonzalez has been very, very good for this team. And mind you, last night, this was without Andrew McCutcheon and O'Neill Cruz. So if you can add O'Neill Cruz and Andrew McCutcheon into the fold here and really make this kind of happen and consistently score four to five runs a game, then Next thing you know, you're cooking with fire because Paul Skeens is going to get you, you know, he's going to get you some things. Then you look at Jared Jones when he eventually comes back. He's going to have quality starts. Bailey Falter when he comes back is going to have quality starts. And even with what you have right now, Quinn Priester came back from the IL yesterday and looked very, very solid. You could argue that he's like their sixth or seventh best starting option even when Marco Gonzalez comes back, he'll be back soon. So the Pirates have one of the things that I always mention that's great for MLB teams is to have pitching depth. And on top of that, if you can have an offense that can show explosion like they did last night, but find a way to do it consistently, then that's a big deal. And also, mind you, the Pirates, the team that led Major League Baseball and home runs in spring training now lead Major League Baseball and home runs in the month of July. Is it really any correlation to the fact that they're winning games like this and hitting home runs a lot? Yes, that is directly correlating to their success, and it's something that was brutally missed for the last couple of months. And if they can do that on a consistent level as well, the sky is the limit for them. I mean, it really is. The ceiling goes up if this Pirates team can become a plus power team, especially from the left-hand side of the plate. And that's why last night was so big, because you saw contributions from everywhere. You, you fought some demons last night against the Milwaukee Brewers. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. So build on it, get a big, crucial series victory tonight. And let's see what happens and see if you can go for a sweep because it would be massive 
for this team to go into the All-Star break with a ton of momentum. Next on the Locked On Pirates podcast, biggest surprises so far. Obviously, Rowdy's turnaround is one of them, but we're going to discuss, uh, discuss some more on today's episode of Locked On Pirates. Today's episode of Locked On Pirates is brought to you by Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. With summer travel heating up, especially travel for baseball games, it's time to explore those U.S. cities you've always secretly wanted to learn more about. And yes, we're even talking about your rival's cities. With hotels, bed and breakfast, vacation rentals, resorts, and so much more on Booking.com, you might just find your perfect stay even in your baseball rival's city. From hotels that look over stadiums to family-friendly resorts, Booking.com has so many choices across the U.S. for your summer travel this MLB season. The right stay can make you a fan of any U.S. city, even your rivals. So book today on Booking.com on the website or in the Booking.com app and find out about your rival cities today. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game, uh, Game Time app and use code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply because with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. Yinzer Palooza is coming up. Not this weekend, but the following weekend. So if you want to go to Yinzer Palooza, get the Wiz Khalifa bobblehead and everything else that Yinzer Palooza has to offer, get your tickets at game time because you could save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. You get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. Game time will also credit you 110% of the difference if you find a price lower somewhere else and your purchase is always covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-M-L-B for $20 off and download Game Time today. Last minute tickets. Lowest price, guaranteed. Today's episode of Locked On Pirates is also brought to you by the 24-7 streaming channel of Locked On, Locked On Sports Today. Brought to you by the local host of Locked On, like myself, the 24-7 streaming channel of Locked On, Locked On Sports Today is bringing you all of the news, analysis, opinions, and reactions to everything going on in the world of sports on YouTube and Amazon Fire TV. Folks, welcome back to the Locked On Pirates podcast here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Don't forget to shoot me a follow on Twitter at MVP underscore Ethan or at Locked On Pirates for all of your news, analysis, opinions, and reactions on this team every single day here on the Locked On Podcast Network. And 2024 for this Pittsburgh Pirates team has been somewhat of an up and down year. It's been a very fun year. I would say probably the funnest year that I've had covering this team. And now my fourth year covering the Pittsburgh Pirates here on locked on. And there's been a lot of surprises so far. And I would say there's not going to be many arguments about it, that the biggest surprise that we've seen from this team over the course of really the last month and a half has been the turnaround of Rowdy Telez, who was one of the offseason acquisitions in the offseason for the Pittsburgh Pirates this year, was expected to come in and be that big left-handed power bat. He was a cheap option as well on the free agent market, a guy that a lot of people were looking forward to having in Pittsburgh, hoping that he would be able to regain some of that 2022 form that he had with the Milwaukee Brewers. But as we all know, things did not go great for Rowdy really at all to start the season. I mean, he batted 192 in April, 143 in May, but once the calendar turned to June 1st, he batted 333 in June. And so far in July, Rowdy Telez is batting an even 400 and slugging 880 in the month of July and has just turned things around for his season so far. Over the past 30 games, he's slashing 347, 392, and 621 with seven of his eight home runs coming in the past 30 days. So you're starting to see Rowdy really lean into that role that the Pirates wanted him to have when he arrived. He's being a power-hitting, 
big stick first baseman that everybody wanted him to be. And I would even argue as well that Rowdy Telez has been very good defensively as well. Something that we were kind of worried about was the defense that he was going to have at first base. He's impressed me over there. He's looked comfortable at first base. He's looked like a guy that doesn't look overwhelmed by the position, much like he has in the past. And if he can continue to hit like this, it's changed the entire narrative of what the Pirates need to do at the trade deadline. This was a team that a month and a half, two months ago, they were going to be looking for a first baseman. But now you have a pretty solid platoon of Rowdy Telez and Connor Joe. And mind you, Rowdy Telez is actually out hitting Connor Joe a good bit now, actually. And Connor Joe had a phenomenal start to the season and has since not had such a great start or such a good run of things as of late. But you look at Rowdy's stats on the season now, 221 at-bats, 249 average, eight home runs, 30 RBIs, and the OPS near a 700. You want that home run number to keep climbing because that's the entire reason that he was brought here. But it has been very refreshing to see Rowdy Telez come out of the hole that he was in. He was in a very bad spot for this team. Many people wanted him gone. It seemed like after that Toronto series, if he didn't perform, he was going to be gone. His buddy Xander shows up, and all of a sudden he's hitting everything. And now look at Rowdy Telez now. Now he's a very strong cleanup hitter for you when he's in the lineup against right-handed pitching. He's even had a little bit of success against left-handed pitching, not a lot of success to really garner saying he needs to be in there all the time against left-handed pitching. But when he's hitting like this, you got to at least give him a shot. And that's what they've done. They've given him a chance to redeem himself, and he has redeemed himself and some so far in the past month and a half. See if he can keep it up. As far as surprises are continued, though, Paul Skeens and Jared Jones have to be up there as well. Jared Jones was a spring training marvel for this team. Not a lot of people knew if he was going to make the club out of spring training. He eventually does. Jared Jones looks phenomenal in doing so, was one of the better rookies in all of Major League Baseball to start the season. Now, we know that Jared Jones will likely be out for, I would say, probably a month now when you're considering everything that's going on with the Pittsburgh Pirates and his injury obviously has that latch strain that they're going to be very, very careful about, but you have to start the conversation with Jones before you started with Paul Skeen, seeing his Skeens didn't arrive until about a month and a half later, but through his first 16 games, Jared Jones has a 3.56 ERA, 98 strikeouts, 91 innings pitched, a 1.11 whip, has been absolutely phenomenal for this team, and in a way, this injury that he's had is kind of helping the Pirates monitor those innings. We talk about monitoring innings all the time with guys like Jared Jones and Paul Skeens, and this is something that happens around all of baseball, really, where these guys don't pitch a ton in the minor leagues. They do, but then they still have to learn how to pitch every five days. They have to get their regimen together. They have to get their schedule together. They have to know how to manage their innings themselves and work through tough times. And through his last seven games, Jones was struggling a bit. 4-5-0 ERA in uh, his last seven starts, 35 strikeouts and uh, 20 walks. So you would like that to kind of even out when he comes back. And I think Jared Jones will be fine. He just was getting pushed back from the league, and that was expected. Paul Skeens, that's going to eventually happen to him too. But he's just that good to where I don't think it'll really matter much. Through his first 10 starts, he has yet to have a loss recorded on the season 5-0. 212 ERA, 59 in the thirds innings pitch, 78 strikeouts, a 1.01 whip. The first, of course, the first number one overall selection in Major League Baseball history to have made the All-Star game in the following season. And if you saw my tweet about it yesterday, Tyler Glasnow has been removed from the game due to injury. Chris Sale is starting on Sunday for the Atlanta Braves, so it is becoming increasingly more likely that Paul Skeens will start the All-Star game for the National League in Texas when that game comes around this time next week. So Paul Skeens, folks, he's been awesome. I mean, you see that I've been growing out the mustache for him. Mustache mania has been going crazy at PNC Park. He's selling out crowds at PNC Park. And what I find most impressive, I think, about Paul Skeens and what we've seen about Paul Skeens so far through the first 10 games of his career is when the fastball is getting hit, he's able to use the splinker and the slider very, very well and use those pitches to his advantage. And also, in the middle of games, he almost has this knack of finding out what he has to do in the middle of games before it even gets to that point. And 
I would even argue that Paul Skeens might end up being a Cy Young candidate if it comes down to it, if he continues to pitch like this and can make it through the rest of the year because he's going to be another guy already at 60 pitches pretty much that the Pirates are going to have to monitor those innings. Unlike Jones, though, built a little bit differently, a little more stocky, a little bit more built, so might not be as much of an issue for him. But Paul Skeen's media has been arguably the biggest surprise that we've seen. We didn't know when he was going to come up. He comes up and has absolutely flashed nothing but brilliance for this Pirates team. And then I would say the last big surprise that we've really seen from this Pirates team this year is the fact that the bullpen is not the strength that we thought that it would be. David Bednar had a very slow start to the year. Aroldis Chapman is up and down, which is kind of expected. But outside of that, that middle relief that the Pirates have been missing has really been a big issue. I mean, Dennis Santana has looked okay. Kyle Nicholas has flashed some good things every once in a while. Carmen Majinski, Josh Fleming, those guys have flashed some good things, even Hunter Stratton. But missing Ryan Barucki and Dowry Moretta, who were two integral parts of your bullpen last season, has hurt this team a lot. And now you have David Bednar, who's hurt nearing a return soon. Ryan Barucki, who's hurt nearing a return soon. That should help supplant this bullpen a little bit, but it has definitely not been the unit that we expected it to be coming into the season when we thought that three-headed monster of Colin Holderman, Araldis Chapman, and David Bednar was just going to shut down games to no end. It's done that sometimes. It's not healthy right now because you obviously have Bednar missing, but when it comes back, you're hoping that the Pittsburgh Pirates can regain some of that and that this bullpen can become a true strength of this team because the starters have done such a good job. There have been games that the bullpen has given up wins in, much like Sunday against the New York Mets. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, if the offense can come around and the bullpen can really come around, folks, this team could be cooking with house money. We're going to continue the mock trade series here on the Locked On Pirates podcast. Today, discussing... A little bit different stuff. We're going to go a little bit higher than what we did yesterday when we discussed Randy Rosarena and Jesse Winker. Today, I'm going to discuss somebody that I'd love the Pirates to go after and then somebody else that I'd like too that's also an outfielder. One of them isn't though. So we're going to discuss on today's episode of Locked on Pirates. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Use the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars because you can now win up to one hundred times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. You could turn ten dollars into one thousand dollars. Prize Picks is available in more than thirty states across the country, including. California, Texas, and Georgia. And right now, the Pittsburgh Pirates are hitting home runs, it seems like, every single night. So you can go bet on Rowdy Telez, Brian Reynolds, O'Neal Cruz, Andrew McCutcheon, everybody on the Pirates. If you think that they can get over a half a home run, you can do that, blend it all together, and win some big money on prize picks. So download the prize picks app today and use code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code locked on MLB on prize picks for a deposit match up to 100 bucks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with prize picks. And welcome back, everybody, to the final part of today's episode of Locked On Pirates here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Don't forget that on the go, you can listen to Pirates games on Sirius XM. All you have to do on the search tab is just look up Pirates to listen to every single Pirates game every single day on Sirius XM Radio. The mock trade series continues today, and we're going to discuss two more players that I'd love the Pirates to go after as the trade deadline continues to approach by the day. Obviously, before I started recording this, there was some Taylor Ward um, stuff going on. See what happens with that. Um, don't really know what's going to happen with it because nothing's – I mean, there's been reports, but we don't really know what's going to go well. In. Um, I'm going to start with Ryan McMahon today. and. Ryan McMahon, folks, is a guy that if he gets in a Pirates uniform, jump for j- jump for joy. Because Ryan McMahon is somebody that I've wanted in a Pirates uniform for a while. He's somebody that I think would work well with this team. And now that you do have Rowdy Telez batting a lot better, I do think it makes it a little more difficult to fit a guy like Ryan McMahon into this team, especially 
with the price tag that would come with him, but he is the lone representative of the Colorado Rockies in the 2024 All-Star game. And at the time that I wrote that big trade piece, the Rockies are terrible. They just are. But shout out to Paul Holden of Locked on Rockies, who does his show every single day and covers that team every single day. Phenomenal guy covering them. But McMahon's been good. 801 OPS, 14 homers, 45 RBIs, and 335 at-bats. And you look at a guy in McMahon that his price tag is going to be hefty. Six-year, $70 million contract with the Rockies. He's controllable until 2028. He costs about $12 million in 2024 and 2025, about $16 million in 2026 and 2027. So a contract that would be a little hefty for this Pirates team, as we know. He would be the most expensive Pirate on the roster, but he would be worth it and some. A 117 OPS plus for McMahon. He adds value to the corner infield spots. He can even play second base. I know Gonzalez has had a really good run of things, but man, a McMahon and Gonzalez um, kind of tandem at second base would be really awesome. You could also get more offensive production out of the third base position, something that we haven't seen from Key Brian Hayes. And McMahon is just as good a glove as Key Brian Hayes as well. Not saying that I want to see Hayes being injured or, um, or not injured, Hayes being benched. But if you can get that kind of offensive value while not losing a lot of the defense in Ryan McMahon at third base, I think you have to do it. And really, he's going to be a target for a lot of different teams. He's a left-handed power bat that is just absolutely insane. He's going to be controllable for a long time. So for the Pirates, it would cost. I had Thomas Harrington who's the number four prospect in the system, Jack Brannigan, the number eight prospect, Patrick Riley, the starting pitcher, the number 19 prospect, and Trez Gonzalez as a potential package. Again, I just don't really know it where McMahon would really fit. He would definitely be more of a long-term option uh, besides Rowdy Telez. And then you really don't know what he, I mean, where would he fit in? I think that's the biggest question. Somebody I know that would definitely fit in with this team, though, is outfielder Brent Rooker of the Oakland Athletics. And as I've mentioned on this show, the Pirates have had an outfield problem. Jack Sawinski has played a little bit better recently. Still not what you expect from him. Michael A. Taylor is giving you next to nothing offensively. Edward Olivares has recently got optioned. And Joshua Palacios, yes, the guy has all the vibes in the world, but he's not going to move the needle for you too much. So where you enter Brett Rooker, who is just a phenomenal baseball player. He plays for the Oakland Athletics, soon to be Sacramento A's, soon to be at Las Vegas A's. But right now, he's exceeding all of his career averages. He's slashing 278, 353, 537, and 890 with 18 homers and 281 at-bats. Those 18 home runs would more than lead this team in, uh, right now for the Pittsburgh Pirates. He also ranks in the 90th percentile or higher in all of baseball in XWOBA, expected slugging, barrel rate, hard hit rate, and sweet spot rate, while also ranking highly in average exit velocity, the 89th percentile, and bat speed, the 80th percentile. And he's also a guy where you're going to have to worry about the whiff rate, 34.9%, and the strikeout rate at 32.8%. But if he's going to bring that kind of power and contact and hit the ball hard all the time, I think you take it. And he would also have more home runs expected in PNC Park than he currently has right now at 19. He had 27 expected home runs in PNC Park last season. So you look at another guy, much like Ryan McMahon, who's controllable until 2028, obviously on a much cheaper deal. He has a negative two outs above average, so you worry about the defense a little bit, but in a shorter right field, I don't think Rooker would have too many issues defensively. 29 years old, entering his prime right now. So much like I said, with McMahon, I think Rooker would come at a premium. Thomas Harrington, number four prospect. Lonnie White Jr. to be a replacement. The number 10 prospect as an outfielder. And then Sander Muth as a right-handed pitcher, the number 11 prospect. So Brent Rooker and Ryan McMahon. I mentioned Randy Rosarena and Jesse Winker yesterday. These are the guys that you want to be thinking about through the trade deadline season, the Pirates could potentially go after to supplant that outfield, to get a left-handed power bat. These are the things you want to think about. And we'll continue this series tomorrow on the Locked on Pirates podcast, where we'll also be recapping everything that happens in the game tonight versus the Milwaukee Brewers as the Pirates aim for a massive series win against their NL Central rivals. We'll be discussing all that tomorrow in the Locked on Pirates podcast. Follow me 
on Twitter at MVP underscore Ethan or at Locked on Pirates. Find this show on YouTube and all of your audio platforms because it is free and available to you every single day here on the Locked on Podcast Network. My name is Ethan Smith. See you in tomorrow. But until then, see you on the flip side.